So welcome everybody to Managing Resistance. This is a community dementia education program uh, of Alzheimer's San Diego. Very happy that you were able to join us this afternoon slash uh, into the evening. We like to try to mix up the days and times and times of day of our programs to try to make them as accessible as we can to as many as, as we can. So I hope that this time worked uh, well for you. Uh, we're very happy to have you with us. My name is Amy Abrams and I am the Director of Education here at Alzheimer's San Diego. And I'm very pleased today to be co-presenting on this important topic with my colleague in the education program, Jean Alton. Hi, Jean. Hi, good afternoon, Amy. Hi, everybody. And we are uh, both pleased to be joined uh, as well by our colleague from our clinical services department, Preston. Hi, Preston. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me. Preston is a social worker on our team, and he will be uh, here throughout the webinar to provide clinical support. So um, he'll be keeping an eye on what's happening in the Q&A responding to uh, written questions as you're submitting them or maybe holding some of the questions so that we can discuss them during our two Q&A breaks that we have planned. Uh, you see here uh, on screen, if you're able to see our agenda here, what we're gonna be covering in our time this afternoon on the topic of managing resistance. First, we will spend a brief amount of time talking about uh, the various uh, uh, diseases that we call dementia, we'll be talking about why dementia causes resistance in people who are living with dementia. What exactly is going on? Uh, why do we see this particular behavioral symptom? And then we'll get into the sort of nuts and bolts, some techniques for effective communication with somebody who's living with dementia and is exhibiting uh, resistance. We'll talk about how to uh, you know, sort of support somebody um, either directly or sometimes we have to do these things sort of carefully and indirectly. We'll talk about um, tips for providing help to somebody uh, in some uh, a few kind of key, very practical areas, talking about um, helping somebody get dressed, helping somebody in the bath, for example. Uh, but hopefully the, the principles that we're talking about will really apply to whatever scenario, hopefully, uh, any number of scenarios that you may be facing. Again, we will be pausing to take your questions a couple of times as we go along. So go ahead and type those as you think of them. And we will wrap up by talking about resources that are available through Alzheimer's San Diego and elsewhere in the community, excuse me, uh, for some additional support. So let's start by talking about the causes of resistance. So caring for a person with dementia, one of my favorite ways to, to think about this, this task, this, this life project of caring for somebody who's living with dementia is to compare it to the experience of standing in the waves. So many of you are probably here in San Diego County with me, but even if you're not, you probably have the experience of standing on an ocean shore like the one you might see here um, on the screen. There's, you know, so imagine yourself there. You're sort of standing out there, maybe up to about your knees or so. And you're, you're standing in those waves. It's, it's beautiful, right? There are definitely moments of beauty, moments of joy and, and happiness in when, when you're living with dementia and when you're caring for somebody who's living with dementia. But the reality of this beautiful environment here is that it's really easy to get pulled under. Right. There are a lot of elements at play. There's a lot that's kind of stirring around under the surface that you might not be aware of, that you might not be able to see coming. Right? So we have to be thoughtful. Uh, we have to be vigilant and, and always sort of be watching for things that might be happening in the environment, things that we might be doing that can catch the person with dementia off guard, but also things that will catch us off guard, things that they might do uh, that might uh, surprise us because often it's what we're doing, it's what we're saying and how we are acting that is causing some of that resistance as I hope we will help you understand here today. So caring for someone with dementia is challenging. No question about it. There are moments of joy, there are moments of beauty, but it's tough. It's really, really tough. And, and why is that? It's, it's not like 
caregiving. It's not like any other kind of caregiving. The person's needs are constantly changing. Right? As dementia develops in the brain, whatever the particular type of dementia is, the disease pathology as it develops there, uh, it spreads. It, it moves into different regions of the brain and every person's gonna experience it differently, but every person is always gonna also sort of constantly be in flux. Right? The, the particular symptoms that they're having can wax and wane in their severity. The types of symptoms that they're experiencing can change you know, from month to month or week to week, or sometimes even, you know, day to day. And honestly, sometimes even hour to hour. So there's, there's a, a constant flux. We have to constantly be sort of watching and reassessing where are we right now? Caring for someone with dementia is a physically challenging endeavor, um, particularly in the late stage of the disease when the person might require a lot of hands-on assistance. But Throughout the disease, uh, most people with dementia will experience some type of sleep disturbance at some point during the disease process. And that means those of us who support them, those of us who care for them are probably gonna be experiencing some sleep disturbance as well, let alone the, the anxiety, the stress, other things that, that might be uh, disturbing our sleep and disturbing our kind of overall physical well-being. right? This, this, is, this is a demanding task. Caring for someone with dementia can be socially isolating. It gets harder to stay socially active, to engage in your community, to do the types of activities and things that you used to do. Um, but also there's just the sort of uh, psychological isolation that can happen, feeling like nobody really understands the reality of what you're, what you're living day to day. And then of course, caring for someone with dementia is challenging because of changing personality features and changing behaviors. And when we talk about changing behaviors, we're talking about changes in what the person says, the things they do, the way they act, sort of just overall behavior. Behavior can change in lots of ways. It's not always negative, right? But one of the most challenging behaviors that we encounter, and probably the reason all of you came here today, is that of resistance. So why is this happening? I have found in, in my years of, of supporting people living with dementia and in particular in supporting their care partners and their caregivers, those who care about them, those who love them, it can be really helpful to be able to visualize what's going on there. In a moment of frustration, I think one of the, one of the challenges we face is that the person outwardly usually looks pretty similar to how they did before they developed the disease, right? There might be some physical changes. Of course, we're all aging and changing as, as life goes on, but for the most part, unlike other types of illnesses or injuries, you can't see any dramatic change in the person. So it can be easy to forget that there's disease happening in their brain. So this image that's on screen here, if you're able to see this, um, I want to encourage you to, it, it can be hard to look at, I think, sometimes for a person with the disease or for a care partner, um, but I hope that thinking about this, being able to visualize this image, remembering Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia are neurodegenerative. They are making brain cells die. They are causing the brain tissue to shrivel. We can't see this from the outside, but if we could, in those moments of frustration, it might be easier for us to be a little more patient, a little more understanding, uh, a little more forgiving. So what exactly is going on in the brain of a person who's living with dementia? Now I'm speaking in very broad, <laughs> very broad generalizations here, but let's, let's have a quick look at the different regions of the brain that are damaged by Alzheimer's disease and related types of dementia and the types of symptoms that that produces, why we see resistance happening. So the temporal lobes, these are kind of right in behind our ears, sort of, or <laughs> in the middle of our brain. Um, our temporal lobes are the region of the brain where Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common type of dementia, and many other types of dementia will start. The, the, the pathology, the plaques and tangles that cause this damage to the brain cells, um, they start in that region of the brain. So when there's damage in the temporal lobe, this is the region of our brain that produces memory loss and language changes. So, you know, for example, somebody who needs to take an essential medication, right? If they've got damage in this part of their brain, 
they might not remember that they take it. They might not remember that they need to take it or why it was ever prescribed to them in the first place. So sometimes your attempts to be helpful, remember it's time to take your medication, right? If there's damage there, we, we can't really assume that they do remember that even something that's, you know, sort of a, a, a long standing fact about themselves, if they have forgotten that, they're definitely gonna resist your attempts to help them with medication that they don't think that they need to take as an example. So the temporal lobe is, is primarily sort of uh, modulating our memory, in particular, our short-term memories and our language. So we do see uh, significant language changes even in the early stages of many people with Alzheimer's and, and other types of dementia. And when it's hard to verbally communicate with another person, sometimes the easiest thing to do is just to say, nope, right? Just to, to resist altogether. It's easier for me to, to, to simply pull back than to try to engage you in conversation about why I don't wanna do this thing. When there's damage in the parietal lobe, these are, this is kind of the big area on the, the crown of our head. Um, what we're gonna see is changes to a person's uh, sensory perception abilities, uh, as well as a uh, loss of motor skill, fine uh, gross motor skill, or in particular, fine motor skill, a loss of dexterity generally, um, especially with the hands, of course. That's, Mostly, mostly what we use our dexterity for. So the, the sensory perception changes, I think are a big part of why we see resistance in people because they're, they're taking in information differently uh, than you are, right? The, the hot weather, for example, might communicate to you, I'm warm and it's this weather that's causing me to be warm and uncomfortable. And therefore I'm gonna address lightly today, or I'm gonna take off this layer that I think might be making me warm. The person is living with dementia that has caused damage in their parietal lobe. It's not that they don't feel that high temperature. It's not that they don't feel the discomfort, but their brain interprets it differently. And it doesn't necessarily tell them it's the weather that's making you uncomfortable, right? And so their, their brain may be giving them different bits of information. So you're finding yourself, for example, in a power struggle about whether or not to wear a sweater or a vest when it's 85 degrees outside, right? So they're, they're resisting, they're not understanding. Again, it, all, it frequently comes back to them just simply not understanding your attempts to be helpful. When there's damage in the occipital lobe, this is a, the region in the back of the brain, uh, what we're going to see are uh, changes in the person's not only, not not specifically their vision, but more, it's about their visual field. So they are seeing things with a much narrower field of peripheral vision. Uh, and what this does is this causes significant changes in, uh, again, how they're interpreting things. Their depth perception is different. Their ability to interpret contrast, to assess movement, how fast something is moving, whether it's moving toward them, away from them. Uh, so there's visual field changes, there's, there's challenges with um, balance as a result of that, right? If you're walking around in a set of, uh, you know, narrow goggles, for example, where your periphery, peripheral field of vision is very narrow, this is going to cause a lot of difficulty with your ability to kind of navigate your environment safely or to, to navigate it the way that you used to. So what might this look like in terms of uh, a resistant behavior? I mean, one of the the most common challenges that families tell us they're facing is getting someone to agree to take a bath, in particular to, to take a shower. Showers are generally easier uh, for people to kind of navigate in and out of than baths, but showers can be very scary. Sort of combine that damage in the parietal lobe that changes the way you perceive your environment. Combine that with changes to the person's field of vision. And then imagine, right, in a shower stall, there's all of this sound, there's echo, there's stuff coming down that you can't see where it's coming from, right? This can be a very confusing, agitating, scary experience for people. And over time, we do tend to see people uh, beginning to refuse, um, re beginning to refuse to go. It's very easy for us as well-meaning, family members, friends, care partners, supporters to startle people who are living with dementia because of these changes in their peripheral field of vision. 
right? If again, remember, imagine yourself sitting wherever you're sitting right now, you're sitting uh, there with a, a, a set of goggles on that restrict your field of vision. If somebody were to come up to me right now, right over my shoulder, if I had a healthy, normal brain and a, a full field of vision, I'd see them over there, but I wouldn't necessarily see them if I'm living with dementia. So they put their hand on my shoulder, they come into my field of vision, they start talking to me. I didn't know they were there, right? Combine that with the short-term memory problem. You've really surprised me, scared me. And you're probably, right, again, in your, in your attempts to be helpful with me, um, you're probably setting me up to instantly uh, become a little agitated, combative, and resist um, your attempts to be helpful. And then finally, the frontal lobe. This is a big, diverse, lots of different parts of our, lots of different parts in this region of our brain. Um, this is a, a, a key part of the brain for understanding a lot of the behavioral changes that we see in people who are living with dementia. Um, the frontal lobe is responsible for a lot of our executive functioning, our ability to make decisions, to use insight, to apply reason uh, or judgment to a situation or take in information and decide what to do with it. Um, uh, this is also the part of our brain that regulates our emotions. So our, our personality, our behavior is not necessarily sort of centered in this region of our brain, but this is the part of our brain that allows us to kind of modulate on a good day or a bad day to sort of hold it together, if you will, right? You're, you're having a stressful day, but you can sort of take a deep breath and, and work through it and still be reasonably pleasant, right, to, to the people around you. Um, this is also the part of our brain that allows us to have empathy for another person, to see a conversation, to see a situation uh, from another person's perspective. This is damaged in, in the brains of people who are living with dementia. So I hope that this helps explain um, uh, why someone who's kind of refusing your kind and, and loving gestures might not understand, right? Why you're being the difficult one, right? So the, the common, <clears throat> excuse me, the most common personality and behavioral changes that we see in people who are living with dementia are laid out for you here. Um, all of these are, again, I wanna emphasize, these are symptoms of the disease. These are not things that the person is doing on purpose, right? They're struggling with decision-making, judgment, becoming agitated, becoming combative, uh, having a hard time with initiating tasks, getting started on something or terminating a task. Um, I might start mm, dusting or sweeping or something around the house and then have a really hard time stopping, even though it's, you know, I've been doing it for hours and it's time to go to bed, uh, for example. Confabulation, this is a, a fancy word that we use for the, the practice or the the behavior. It's something we all do. All of our brains do this, but um, it's it's making stuff up right? Confabulation, filling in the gaps of information. People with dementia do this even more uh, than people who don't have dementia because there's a, there's a lot more in terms of gaps and misunderstanding in their memory and their perception of their environment. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of the time that the stuff that the brain makes up, uh, it fills it in with things that make the person feel suspicious, make them feel paranoid or not trust people around them. So that will certainly contribute to a person feeling resistant, right? They're, they're interpreting other people's uh, actions and intentions around them as maybe not, not so good, not in their best interest. Um, there is also a condition that we're, we're aware of in many people living with dementia um, uh, called anosognosia. And what this means is that the person does not have good insight into what's changing with them. Uh, if I have a memory problem that restricts me, makes me unable to remember that I'm not remembering things, right? It's a, a serious dilemma. It's a big catch-22 of many of these conditions. Um, so if I have this, not every person with dementia has that. Some people with dementia understand things are changing with me and I need help, uh, but not everyone. So if I don't have insight into my own care needs, right? Again, I'm gonna swat away anybody that's in my space uh, trying to help me. So all of this sort of uh, layers, layers on uh, itself um, and leads to in many people, 
um, this, this set of, this cluster of behaviors that we refer to as resistance. Um, in the next section, Jean is gonna talk more about what resistance looks like and what we mean by that um, before we get into the strategies of, 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 of approaching it and responding to it. But before we do that, uh, have any questions come in that we can address? Not yet, but right. I think um, I, I'm sure we'll be getting some more. Feel free, everybody, to put your uh, any questions in the Q and A. We'd be more than happy to get to them. Okay, great. Well, we uh, we're we're all about uh, efficiency of time here, so we will keep moving. And if you have questions on any of these brain changes that I've been talking about, you can feel free to um, ask them in the next section, uh, in the next Q and A when we get there. Um, we'll be okay. Um, all right. All right. Okay, I'm going to hand it on over. Thank you so much, Amy. So what we're going to talk about now is some techniques for effective communication. And let me just, um, start by saying is we have a whole class, a whole webinar devoted to this topic of communication skills. And if you haven't had an opportunity to attend that webinar, um, please think about maybe uh, doing that here in the next few weeks. Uh, have a look on our website to see when that will be coming up next. But also if you are looking you know, for some quick tips and ideas right now, we do have um, a recorded, pre-recorded, uh, um, version of the communication skills in our webinar library that you can watch at your convenience to get just more information and thoughts and ideas on how to how to improve communication and make it more effective with your person living with dementia. So let's let's kind of have a look at that and see what we may have. Yeah, on my slides. There we go. So what is resistance? Well, it's many different things. And chief of which I would say and suggest uh, through my professional experience, working directly with people with dementia, but also just working with families over the years, one of the big pieces of resistance that we see in people living with dementia is apathy. And it is, um, caused again, as Amy said, all of these types of resistance are, are being caused ultimately because of damage that is going on in the brain and the different parts of the brain and in terms of how information is processed. So apathy is one of those areas that uh, is, a, is a frequent type of resistance in people living with dementia. And it's everything from very kind of passive apathy in the sense of um, a person might feel hungry or thirsty. And even though their body's giving them those signals, they are not showing the initiative to get up and do that. But additionally, it can be um, apathy of a sort where even if you are right there as the care partner for somebody living with, de with dementia, if you are saying, are you thirsty? Should I get you a glass of water? Oftentimes the default answer is no, no, I'm fine. Would you like lunch? No. Would you like to go for a walk? No. So keep that in mind that apathy is just a big part of the uh, dementia experience for somebody diagnosed with dementia. And so we have to think about different ways of um, talking to our to people living with dementia to be able to kind of sidestep that apathy. And we'll get into what those tips are in a few slides here. Arguing is also a type of resistance to be sure, um, being, you know, just disagreeing with one another. And, you know, lots of times I think arguing and uh, some of these other types of resistance that we see are coming out of the desire to uh, protect and preserve one's autonomy. So, you know, if people are telling us what 
they want us to do or what they think we should be doing, we might argue um, against that, that no, we're okay. Um, so in other words, as a care partner, you might be going up to a person that you're caring for living with dementia and saying, would you like some help with that? And be starting to actually get hands on to do provide some help. And they might be saying, no, no, I've got this, I'm fine. Even though we ourselves as care partners can see that they are struggling you know, our desire to help is right there. And we're kind of um, saying, well, no, you know, I, it looks like you need a little help here. You've got the buttons on your shirt done up the wrong way. Let me help you with that. No, no, I've got this. I don't need your help. So we see that happening as well, too. And then there's just simply refusing assistance where, again, we're doing our best as care partners to provide the support and the help and, and the care that, um, that we are perceiving this person needs and they are simply refusing our assistance. Sometimes that might flash over into combativeness where um, it's kind of a, a situation that amps up in terms of um, the energy level of it and it starts to get more confrontative and it, it can result in some combativeness that could be everything from just kind of shouting, saying, no, I don't need your help, or putting up an arm to try and push you away from, from them. I mean, we do see that happening sometimes too. And of course, ultimately, what all these types of resistance are is communicating, no, no, I don't want to do that, or I don't need your help, or whatever it is, the, the ultimate answer is no. And so what do we, what do we do with that? What is no versus yes? Well, it's important for us to, again, go back to the brain structure that Amy was talking about before. In addition to all the different parts of the brain that we see here, have a look there in the very middle of this multicolored brain, you'll see a little kind of darker orange little peanut and with the arrow pointing to it and it's called the amygdala. And the amygdala is a, a very important part of our brain that is responsible for um, lots of our responses over the course of our lives. And that includes for people living with dementia. The amygdala is the part of the brain that keeps us safe from harm. And it's really kind of buried in there in the, in the middle of the brain. And so it, you know, the damage that we see with dementia is global, but the amygdala due to its location and how dementia often, not always, but often uh, spreads globally, the amygdala kind of remains um, less impacted by the dementia. And so what does that mean? means that when um, people living with dementia are feeling like they're being pressured or pushed or asked to do things they don't want to do, the amygdala responds. And so um, when we say yes, that we're willing to do something, we are opening ourselves up to um, potential harm. Okay, so if I say, yes, I'll go for a walk, um, that's changing everything for me. What does that mean? I'm going to go out into an environment I might not be sure of or be familiar with. Um, I'm going to rely on this person with me that I may or may not know very well. Uh, can I trust them? Do I feel safe with them? There's all sorts of kind of safety issues. Uh, coupled with this decision of saying yes, whereas no keeps us safe, keeps us safe from harm. I will stay right where I am. I'm not going into an environment I don't know. Uh, I'm not gonna go with this person I don't know very well, or maybe don't trust very well. So saying no is the safe answer versus saying yes. So what is happening in their brain? Well, when, um, when we meet with uh, resistance, we, 
we are dealing with a person who has a healthy amygdala. And um, the other parts of, of responses to no from the amygdala might also be, you know, we call it fight, fright, or flight. And uh, no fits into that. And sometimes we might also see some of the fight or, or fright, depending on how the person is perceiving our request or our communications with them. So what we need to do with our folks with living with dementia who are having this amygdala response that say, no, I don't want to do that with you or no, I'm, you know, I'm not going to get in the shower is we need to give their brains a little bit more time to be able to calm down because the amygdala is that instant response so that some of the other functioning parts of their brain can kind of catch up with the scenario. So just think for yourself, uh, when you've had a, an amygdala response, as it were, if someone came up, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I had, actually it was my husband, came up behind me one time. I didn't hear him or feel his presence. And what he did, he had a dead bug in his hand and he just dangled it here into my field of vision. And I didn't know it was a dead bug. And I just went, ah! And my hands went up like this and I, I screamed way, way louder than what I just illustrated to you. I actually even knocked the chair over. I had a complete fright and flight response. So just think about that for a minute and remember that our, our people living with dementia have those same kind of responses from the amygdala and that it does take us and them longer to, to just let our amygdalas calm down so that we can have a better response going on. So additionally then, what we need to think about is what's happening in our own brain. And, you know, that has impact on um, what we're trying to accomplish with our folks living with dementia. And so think about how your amygdala response may be going on, too. You're getting frustrated with your person that's saying no. Um, you've got an, ag an agenda, and I, there's nothing wrong with that. We all have agendas. We have things to do. Um, and we're being met with resistance. And that can be very frustrating. And our amygdalas are sometimes going into the response area of things too. So if the care partner's amygdala is responding to the person living with dementia's amygdala, you've got a situation that can quickly become, um, escalate the resistance and, and just result in arguing, in um, unsatisfactory communication and uh, uh, a situation that's not pleasant for either of you. So think about that a little bit. So what do we need to do? Uh, take a deep breath to start and think back to those waves that Amy was talking about and just take a deep breath. Just relax. So what I did after my husband dangled that bug in my face, I went in the bedroom and I did have to take some deep breaths because my heart was pounding and I was mad at him and I needed to let that calm down and then went back out to him and, you know, said, I'm sorry, I screamed, you know, screamed and threw my chair back, but this is the reaction I had and it, you scared me with this and, and to just talk it through. Um, that's, you know, that's the kind of approach at least we want to try with our folks with dementia is to just slow it down, check our own responses and go back and give things a try again. So we want to respond versus react. Now, again, think about these waves. And as Amy said, you know, when those waves are coming in, if you have a big wave coming in, what are you going to do? Are you going to stand firm with the wave? Or are you going to dive into the wave? 
what, what's going to be your response? What do you think is going to work best for you? And the reality is, is if we try to stand firm in the wave, Mother Nature almost always wins, right? So um, oftentimes, if we have a big wave coming in, the best approach is to dive in and dive under it so that the water doesn't knock us over, the wave doesn't knock us over, and we come out on the other side. So how do we look at this reacting versus responding? Well, a couple of different things. Reacting means correcting, confronting, and arguing. All of these things. We all do them. These are all part of life, and it's a part of our communication. Um, and Oftentimes, it's not a part of successful communication. When we're responding, we are validating, reassuring, and redirecting. And these are the ways to have much more successful interactions and communications with people living with dementia. So it's always important for us to keep in mind these differences between reacting versus responding and do our very best to try and respond. And that takes time and practice, folks. And I'm sure some of you are already well-schooled in that. And this is, again, where classes like communication skills can help you with that. You need to learn new techniques and new responses. You need to practice them. That's how you become better at them. So, what are the communication techniques? Well, here's, here's some of them. Using a calm and reassuring tone is always a good thing. Even if you feel your own uh, frustration level going up or, or um, anger or anxiety or whatever it might be, do your very best to modulate your tone of your voice and to keep your, your voice and how you are speaking at a nice, even and calm manner, okay? Use short, clear directions and questions. Don't be giving too much information in one fell swoop about why you have to have a shower right now today because we've got a doctor's appointment and it's already been scheduled for several months. We can't get back in to see him for two or three months if we don't go today. So you, well, come on, mom, let's get going. Too much information there. So keep it short, clear, and with the questions as well too. Allow for plenty of time, extra time. Budget in extra time for some of these things. And that's an important part of the planning process for people as care partners. Repeat as you need for understanding and do your best to try and repeat in the same manner. If I ask you to take a shower right now and you say no, and then I come back and say, well, look, you need to, you need to have some kind of bath or wash up because I feel like I'm smelling some body odor on you now. And, you know, this is really important. We need to get this happening. I've repeated myself in a sense, but it's been kind of another big old mess of information. So Repeat yourself as needed and try to repeat in the same manner. Validate and agree. There's really kind of nothing better. And think about it. When we are ourselves are feeling like we want to be resistant and push back and say no, to have somebody just validate and agree with us goes a long way in bringing that energy level and that frustration level down. Mom, I know. Showers aren't the best thing. I get it. I'm sorry. And maybe there's something I can do to help you with the shower. So validating and agreeing. And here, I already jumped to it. Forgive and apologize. The power of the words, I'm sorry, are huge. And sometimes we're not necessarily saying I'm sorry as in accepting blame. But just, it's a blanket, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry we're in this situation. I'm sorry that um, showers don't feel good, whatever it might be. We're just acknowledging that it's tough. 
And, you know, most certainly here, um, we will say one of the important, really important communication tips, which is not really intuitive for most of us, and especially when we're talking and communicating with people living with dementia, but is it is to talk less and listen and observe more. So less words um, and most certainly uh, listening more to what's going on, to hear what they're saying and to observe as well too. And so I'm going to turn it back over here to Amy, if I can get my, there we go. And Amy's going to uh, give you all some tips on how to provide help, the specific tips in specific scenarios, how to provide help to someone who's resisting your assistance. Here you go, Amy. Yeah, so what we'll, what we'll spend some time doing now is taking what we know about the state of the brain, the causes of resistance, the, way, the ways that it might look, as well as this self-awareness that we now have about our own high-functioning amygdala and our own defensiveness and, and reactiveness and, and Jean's good advice to just pause, take a deep breath and, and think it through. Give, give these smarter regions, but slower regions of your brain some time to think of something that's going to be a more helpful response rather than a defensive or angry or scared uh, reaction. So uh, I want to start by uh, just some kind of general comments for providing care. And when I say care, uh, I want to be clear, I'm not talking just about providing hands-on assistance with uh, daily personal care tasks. That is part of providing care. But providing care also means encouraging somebody to get outside for a walk, right? It also encourages somebody to uh, engage socially, to, to go have a cup of coffee and chat with an old friend. Um, there are lots of different ways that we care for and support people who are living with dementia. When we are attempting to provide assistance, especially when it's hands-on assistance that requires us to kind of get into the person's personal space, a few things to be keeping in mind. First, remember that unfortunately at this time, uh, we don't have a, a, a form of treatment. We don't have a, a cure, clearly. We don't have a way to stop the progressive loss of function that dementia causes. So we have to be thinking about that. Uh, and that seems obvious, but actually it's, it's very challenging for most of us who have been caregivers to children that are growing uh, and developing and learning new skills. Or if you've cared for somebody who's recovering from an illness or an injury, right? They're getting stronger, they're regaining skills and abilities that they lost. Um, we have to come at this type of caregiving a little bit differently because we have to acknowledge over time, while the person may definitely retain skills, they may plateau and, and not decline for a time, they may have good and bad days. So they're, they're doing a little better today than they were yesterday. Uh, all of that is true and all of that is great. Uh, but we have to remember that over time, what we expect to see is, is a, a steady, slow decline in the person's function. So our goal in supporting someone living with dementia is not to rehab them. Right? We're not trying to get them back to a state of independence. Our goal is to help them feel as in control and as autonomous as they can. Remember all those things we talked about in the brain. Remember all those different types of resistance that Jean talked about. Um, it, whatever we can do to help the person feel as in control about the decisions that are getting made about for them, uh, about their lives um, and about their day to day, the more autonomy we can help them feel, uh, the more successful our attempts are uh, going to be. So we need to be reasonable in our expectations of them and knowing what we know about the progressive changes that come with dementia, we need to be flexible in our definitions. Right? Um, if, if somebody is just simply not going to take a bath today, they're just not going to take that shower that Jean noted that, you know, you're it's time, you know that it's time. Maybe there's some different definition we can use of what it means to get cleaned up today, 
right? Hop in the bathing suit and go for a dip in the hot tub or, you know, some, something that we can just, just for this moment, adjust our expectations and be a little bit flexible. Not a permanent solution, uh, but something that might work for today. One of the important themes that we'll be talking about in the rest of this section here is trying to come alongside the person and do things with them rather than sort of hovering over them, reaching into their space and doing things to them or doing things for them. Now, sometimes you have to do that. The person has lost function. They have lost the ability, for example, to put on their own shoes, but you can still go about the task of helping them get their shoes on in a way that, that makes them feel that they are in control of this movement or this decision. You're, you're, helping, it, you're helping them with it. You're not doing something to them. Um, it's, a, it's an important shift in our perspective. We'll be much more successful in, uh, in countering resistance if, we are tr if we're providing help in an environment that's conducive to that. So we call this trying to make the environment as dementia friendly as possible, reducing the amount of clutter, that's physical clutter, you know, stuff, obstacles, things that make it hard for them to kind of navigate around the space. Um, have the space prepared with the items that you need for this task. You want somebody to go outside and go for a walk. Well, let's have the clothes ready. Let's have the shoes, you know, near the door, for example, the sunblock out on the counter, whatever those things might be. So having what you need nearby and trying to reduce the other distractions and clutter that might, you know, attract their attention elsewhere um, or make them think, no, I'd rather do this rather than this other thing that you're trying to get me to, to pay attention to. Minimizing distractions, that can be sounds, it can be mirrors, it can be um, activity, you know, something happening uh, outside of a window, a television, uh, a radio. Distraction can come in many forms, but the less distraction in the environment, uh, the less agitation you're likely to encounter and the more the person will be able to focus on you and, and this task that you're trying to accomplish. Um, have the, have a, a place, a safe and comfortable place for them to sit, uh, a chair with arms if, if that's what they need, space for a wheelchair, but also space for you. If you're a person who's gonna be there in their space, um, make sure that you've got, you've got what you need to be comfortable and, and close by without having to kind of overcrowd them if at all possible. And then remembering the, the damage in the parietal lobes that I was talking about earlier in the program and the way the person is likely to perceive their environment differently, be sure to have good lighting uh, wherever it is that you're, you're assisting somebody who's living with dementia, make sure that if you can, can't always do this, but try to keep the, the temperature of the room comfortable. If you're trying to get somebody to go into the bedroom to change their clothes and the bedroom is freezing cold, right? One of the sources of resistance may be, no, if I, if I take off my robe, I'm going to be really, really cold, right? So thinking about what you can do to make the environment as conducive as possible. So now I'm going to run through a, a few brief scenarios here, a few different um, caregiving uh, situations where you are likely to encounter somebody being resistant. Um, and, uh, and, and again, I want to encourage you, you may not right now need to help somebody with bathing and showering, for example, but try to think about the principles and how they apply um, to your specific need. And if you've got a, a particular scenario question that you want to ask about, please feel, feel free to do that. And we can, we can discuss that when we break. So bathing and showering, gathering all those supplies that you need in advance, what you don't want to do is get somebody to agree to go take a shower, you get them in there and ah, you don't have it, they don't have the soap, you don't have the washcloth, and all of the things that you need. Have the room ready before they get there, um, preparing the lighting, the temperature, if things like music or, you know, smells, you know, something might entice them to, to be a little more inclined to go in there in the first place, you know, get all of that set up in advance. Um, be very clear and directive in your, in your speech. Um, Jean's uh, comment about sometimes the most effective form of communication is just not talking at all. Uh, it's, it's, really, it's really true, it's really effective. Um, instead of trying to talk the person into why they need to take the shower, why they need to go into the bathroom, simply saying something like, you know, 
quietly getting everything set up in advance and then just open the door. Oh, well, your bath is ready. It's shower time, right? Just being very clear and directive, not engaging in the push and pull. This can be hard for us because we, we want to give people choice, right? Remember, we're used to thinking about helping people be as independent as they can. We have to think about this differently. This person really needs to get clean. They haven't had a shower in a few days and you're worried about, you know, skin breakdown or infections. You got to get them in there today. We don't want to get into the, will you take a shower? Do you want to take a shower? You don't want to give them that opportunity to give you that no that Jean was talking about. So being simple, clear, and direct in your prompts, sometimes saying nothing at all, right? Just, just offering an arm, getting them to stand up and walk with you and lo and behold, you end up in the bathroom, right? Um, also just a, a quick tip on bathing and showering, remembering that uh, privacy and dignity are always important to all of us in all care tasks, whether it's bathing, changing our clothes, um, you know, toileting, whatever it might be. So you might want to consider covering the person with towels. If they're very, you know, shy about being naked in front of you, you might even consider just allowing them to go into the shower in their underclothes. Right? So they get wet, they'll take them off, right? It's uncomfortable to be in wet clothes. And eventually they can kind of work through that and remember the, the value of uh, being flexible and, and changing, adjusting your expectations when you need to. Um, so let's talk a little bit here about getting dressed. By the way, we do have tip sheets um, at Alzheimer's San Diego on a lot of these topics, on personal care, um, personal care related topics uh, that we can send to you. So um, as we go along here, Preston will uh, put a, a, a link in the chat that you can use to request follow up from a member of our clinical services team. So if you want some more sort of tips and guidelines on any of these types of care, we do have some, some detailed handouts that, that we can get to you. Um, on the subject of getting dressed, keep it simple, right? Another kind of common theme in, in managing resistance, the, the fewer steps, the less you're asking the person to think about, to make decisions about, to choose about, <laughs> um, the less you're asking and demanding of the person, the, the, the better off, uh, the better off this interaction is, the better this interaction will go. So simplifying the clothing, um, simple footwear, right? That's not hard for them to get in and out of. Um, a, a lot of people actually, what they'll do is buy clothing one size larger, uh, it, but you know, not looking like they're floating in you know, giant frumpy clothes, but one size up makes it so much easier to help a person get in and out, right? If they don't have to get in and out of tight armholes and, and leg holes. So one, th one thing to consider, sometimes the resistance is like physical, this item is too constricting. Um, laying out clothing in order, in the order in which they're gonna put it on, remembering they might not be able to figure that out on their own. That's a pretty complex cognitive task. So doing what you can to sort of get, get the scene set for them as, as best you can. Respecting their choices, respecting their privacy um, when you can, being um, just, being aware that even no matter what your relationship is to this person, this might be your spouse of 40 years, right? They still might not want you helping them get their underwear on and off, right? This is an uncomfortable task for many people. So not making assumptions about what they would or would not want in the way of assistance from you, respecting uh, their dignity as best you can. And again, just being very clear, very simple, very directive in, in the steps that you're asking them to follow one at a time, one simple step. And when that's completed, now we'll talk about the next one. You may need to provide verbal cueing, telling them what to do. You may also need to provide physical cueing. Sometimes that means literally reaching over and you know buttoning a button for someone, but it might also just be modeling for them, showing them what you wanna do, what you want them to do. They need to, they haven't been drinking enough water today, right? Pick up your own glass of water and, and show them, right? point at it, show them what you're doing. Giving that kind of gentle physical cueing uh, can sometimes be enough to just kind of get the person started. At mealtime, uh, meals and eating, be thoughtful about the timing of meals, the schedule and the coursing of meals. Sometimes just having the 
ton of stuff on the plate, all, even if they're a big eater with a good healthy appetite, having all that different stuff on the plate all at the same time can be challenging. Where am I supposed to start? Which, which utensil goes with what? So a lot of the resistance around eating that we find in people with dementia is really just a problem of initiation, just not really knowing where to start and what it is I'm supposed to be doing here. So if you can time the meal, course the meal, you know, I'm not suggesting 16 course meals, but you know, maybe the salad does come separately from uh, the, the main entree so that they don't have to make a decision about what to eat first. They just can eat what's in front of them. Um, again, modeling for them. Uh, I'm gonna skip ahead to that last point there because I think it's so important, eating together. A lot of people just from kind of a, a practical, they're, they're being practical about this. Uh, I got other stuff to do. Uh, so I'm gonna prepare their meal. We're not gonna be eating the same thing anyway. I'll prepare their meal and I'll set it down in front of them and then I'll go put in a load of laundry, right? I get it. And this works. Uh, with children. This works with people who don't really care whether or not they're eating alone. But most of us, by a certain age, have come to expect mealtime is something we do with other people. So if my husband were to just like put down my dinner and walk away to the other room, right, I would be sitting there waiting for him to come back because dinner is something that we do together. Right. So a lot of the time, the, the resistance that we see in people who don't want to eat, it's because we're not really presenting the meal the right way. Right. We're, we're putting a, too much in front of them at once. Uh, we're maybe giving them food that needs to be cut when, in fact, they'd really benefit from something that they could use a spoon or even better, they can use their their fingers with. We're just sort of asking too much of them at once. And so what they do instead is say, no, I'm not hungry right? No is always easier than yes, as, as Jean explained to us. Um, so again, making meals a social thing when you can. You may not be hungry, you may not want to eat what they're eating, but do what you can to take a moment, sit down next to them, have a, a plate that looks similar, right? Eat something with them, show them what it is that you want them to be doing. And often um, you're going to be able to break through that resistance. Medications. I'm going to actually be showing you uh, a short video here in a moment um, on this topic. So I'll be brief here because it covers very well a lot of what you see on the slide here. Um, but think carefully about, you know, we don't want to be advising you to, to skip someone's medications, but talk to their doctor, talk to a pharmacist about what are the most important medications. If you're caring for somebody who's really resistant to taking medication, uh, and you might be able to get one or two down, but you're not going to get all six down. Uh, what are the, where, where should I start? What are the most important medications? Um, if a person tends to be less resistant, tends to be more uh, easygoing, in a better mood, functioning a little better at a certain time of day, might you be able to move the administration of the medication to that time of day? A lot of people really struggle in the afternoons. Um, and the evenings around dinner time. And if they've got dinner time medications, a, a lot of caregivers will struggle with that. So it, if they do better in the morning, maybe talk with the pharmacist or the doctor about, you know, could this, um, could this be, uh, could we change the way we dose this, the way we time this um, during the day so that we can, we can try to get it down when, when they're functioning a little bit better. Um, really advise talking with a pharmacist uh, uh, about, you know, whether or not a medication can be administered in a different form. Don't crush things if you're not sure that they're safe to be crushed. Don't cut them unless they're still going to be effective when they're cut. Uh, but a, a good pharmacist can, a good consultation with a pharmacist can go a long way in helping you think about kind of creative solutions. So I'm going to show you this short uh, video. Before I do that, what I'd like to do, I'm going to switch my screen here just for a moment and show you the website. Hopefully you're seeing that. Show you the, the website of UCLA's Alzheimer's and Dementia Care Program. Um, this uh, is a terrific resource. And in the follow-up email that goes out to all of you, we will send you a link to this website. Um, but what they have here is a, a whole array, a library of videos on different topics. Um, they explain kind of our, 
our common response, what most of us are likely to do if we don't have any training, uh, give, get some advice from an expert, a UCLA uh, physician, usually in most of the videos, and then show you an example of um, what you might do instead. So I just wanted you to see what this website looks like. There's, um, there we go, a whole host of uh, all of these different um, topics and uh, lots of different uh, languages available as well. A really great resource. So now let me go back to our video. And Gina Preston, just pipe up if any of my sharing is not working as well as I think it is. But hopefully you can all see this. I'm going to play this short video um, and then we'll, we'll come back and discuss. Grandma hates taking her medicine, even after I tell her what it's for. She asks 10 different times why she's taking it. What should I do? Time to take your medicine, Grandma. I don't need to take medicine. Who said I have to take that medicine? For what? What are you talking about, Grandma? You have high blood pressure, and diabetes. Dr. Brown said if you don't take your medicine, you're going to get sick. I don't need pills. Why do we have to do this every day? Just take your pills. I give up. Refusal to take medication is a common manifestation of dementia. It can be very frustrating for the family, particularly as this has to be done every day. Stay calm and be patient, keeping in mind that these medications help your loved one stay healthy. Time to take your medicine, Grandma. I don't need to take medicine. Who said I have to take medicine? For what? Remember, Dr. Brown said you have to take medicine for your blood pressure and your diabetes. He even wrote a note. My patient, Aura Jackson, that's you, needs to take her blood pressure and diabetes medicine every day. So let's take your medicine for Dr. Brown. Okay, I'll take it today, but maybe not tomorrow only because Dr. Brown said it's a good idea. Okay. Oh, I have an idea. Let's take the dogs outside for a walk. It's a beautiful day. Do not allow your annoyance or frustration to become part of the problem. Your loved one may pick up on your emotions and become annoyed with herself or you. Here are a few tips on how to improve the situation. Pick a doctor or an individual that she wants to please and tell her that this person advises her to take these medications. If swallowing pills is the issue, check with your pharmacy to see if the medications are available in liquid form. If not, Consider crushing pills into applesauce or pudding to make them more palatable. Give pills one at a time with water. Sit next to your loved one when you try to offer the medications instead of over her. If she continues to refuse, allow her to calm down for several minutes then try again. Remember to be patient as this process may take several attempts. In regards to specific medications, prioritize the most important medications to be taken first. Move forward here. Okay, so um, yes, Jean, thank you. Uh, I, I wanna talk uh, briefly about what, what 
what we saw in that video. Um, what did you see that the, the granddaughter in this scenario, what did she do differently in that second video? She sat down beside a grandma right away rather than kind of hovering over her and saying- Totally, that was job number one right there, yep. Mm -hmm. So right away, that seems like she's like, just first of all, making more of a connection with grandma. And she was prepared. She had the note from the doctor with her. So she didn't go into an argument with grandma about you need to take, you know, you need to take this. She just kind of said, well, doctor, she's kind of putting the responsibility on it to the doctor, who seems to be someone that grandma is willing to listen to, at least in the moment. She said, I'll take them for today. Maybe not tomorrow. Yes. Today. That's another and, moment that always catches me because I think there, what I, when I watch that, I try to imagine myself being that granddaughter and you know, what would be my impulse in that moment is to say, well, you're going to have to take it tomorrow. You know, maybe not in a mean way, but I would, I would find myself kind of naturally kind of wanting to ramp up and, and prepare for tomorrow's battle right now. No, you're going to have to take this tomorrow too. Um, and instead what I noticed she does is she just goes, okay. <laughs> Yeah. That's, a, you know, whatever's going on in the daughter, daughter's head or the granddaughter's head. It's just kind of like, well, she's not going to engage in that today. And yeah. that's good strategy, too. Yes. If there's anything else that any of you saw or noticed or have questions about, feel free to, to drop that into the chat um, or in, into the Q&A. We can, we can talk about that. Um, as well. But Jean, I think you, br I've, I've never actually thought of that before in watching this particular video, but you brought up another really good point. And that is that the granddaughter, you know, I talked in the earlier section about uh, coming prepared, right? In this scenario, I would have thought of, you know, you got to have the water, you got to have the pill, you got to have space on the couch to sit next to her. I would not have thought of getting the letter from the doctor and having that in my back pocket and being ready to whip it out if, if she gets, uh, you know, she starts getting testy with me. Uh, but that's a, that's a great observation. She was ready with that. She yeah. was. And part of that is also just mental preparation yeah. that this may be something that grandma's going to resist. So that is allowing her to um, respond versus react as well yes. too. Yes, totally. The first one was all about reaction. Uh, yeah. She's, oh, why do we have to do this every day? And uh, the second one was like, okay, you're telling me right now that you might not do this for me tomorrow. Fine. Like, right, but it, for right now, this worked. Let's let's go walk the dog. <laughs> so, yeah, I like that a lot. Great. Thank you. Well, in summary, I, I hope that you can see how um, the, these tips that we provided and the tips that are shared in, in the, that one example of UCLA, UCLA's really great uh, library of, of caregiving videos, um, that there are these principles that sort of apply broadly to lots of different types of um, resistance. So as, as best we can, to, to try to summarize, as best we can honor the person's normal ways of living and doing things. This is not always possible. Right? If they always took their shower right before bed and now they live in an environment where that's not possible for some reason, they're in a care community and there's not enough staff in the evenings to do that, right? There might be reasons that that can't happen. But as best we can, honoring their personal routines and rituals and ways of sort of living and moving about their space is, is going to help them feel as autonomous and in control of their life as possible. Consider the time of day. Now, in, in that video, we don't we couldn't tell if it was morning or night. Uh, I guess we could assume it maybe wasn't late at night because they were going to go walk the day, walk the dog. And she said it's a beautiful day. But um, consider the time of day when the person tends to function their best. If you're trying to engage in a conversation, you're trying to get the person to go for a walk or, or just to sort of calm down and, and engage in a pleasant, you know, enjoyable, relaxing activity. Um, and they're just not having it right now. Um, I would suggest just sort of take that deep breath, walk away and maybe try again in another hour, try again if they've got a better time of day later, later that day. 
provide that validation and reassurance um, as best we can. That was um, an that's another thing I, I like in many of the videos that are um, that were put together by UCLA is that what we see people saying is not, you know, well, you have to take this medication, right? Let, letting the person sort of get it, get it off their chest. And instead of fighting with them, you do have to take this. The doctor said you have to take this, right? Instead, like just sort of acknowledging, I know, I know taking medication, it stinks. I don't like taking mine either, right? That's a very uh, diffusing, validating kind of a response. Um, so lots of validation, lots of reassurance, giving the, the verbal cues, um, giving visual cues, showing them. Maybe, maybe you don't have medications you need to take, but you could like eat a Skittle or something, you know, a, a raisin while they're, while they're doing it so that it's this thing that we're kind of doing together um, or potentially offering physical assistance, giving uh, physical cues or physical help with taking medication. And uh, on, the, on the topic of, of that clear directive language, trying your best to keep your, uh, to keep your statements, to keep your requests positive, instead of telling someone what it is that you don't want them to do. And you'd be surprised if you sort of step back and, and listen to yourself through the course of a day, if you're a caregiver to someone, you'd be surprised how often you're probably telling someone not to do something or to do it differently. Um, try to catch that, that impulse when you can um, and instead tell them what it is that you do want them to do, right? Instead of uh, stop always leaving, stop leaving the drawers open in the kitchen all the time, uh, an example from my own life, right? What I might say instead is please close the drawer when you're, when you're done using it. Right. So using positive action oriented language. It's time to take our pills. Your bath is ready. Right. Let's let's try it this way. When you see somebody really struggle, struggling with something instead of getting in their space and taking over and starting to do that thing with them, uh, maybe say something like, you know, it just it seems like a struggle. So let's let's try it a different way. Right. Remember, we're trying to do things alongside with the person in partnership rather than doing things to them or for them. So that was a lot to take in. Uh, you might be listening to all of this uh, advice and strategy and feeling overwhelmed. Right? I'm gonna take you back to that, that beach scene there for a moment. Take a deep breath. Remember that uh, as in the ocean, Right, when you're in the ocean, anyone would tell you it's never a good idea to swim by yourself. Right, um, you you need to have you need to have somebody with you. You need to have some support. Um, this is true in caregiving as well. So in our in our final section, we're going to talk about finding support. But uh, first, we're going to pause for a few questions. Yeah. So there's a couple questions. And by the way, guys, I wasn't ignoring these questions i just wanted to get them <laughs> and answer them it's almost been an hour since they asked but they were so good i wanted to wait till our next q a um so one of the first questions was um from judy asking what do you do when they referencing the person that's living with a memory loss diagnosis what do you do when they absolutely know that they are losing their memory Ah, yes. This Good question one. probably came up when I was talking about people that don't have insight, right? But what do you do when they do? Yes. Jean, do you have some thoughts on that? Well, I do. And I'm going to go back to um, what we talked about earlier, which is some of those specific communication techniques. And I would reference in this situation, the particularly good response of um, acknowledging, validating, and, um, you know, just agreeing and or showing that you're in this together. So in other words, yes, I, you know, it's, I can see that it's frustrating you, this business of memory loss. And I'm sure it would frustrate me too. But I'm here with you. We're a team. And we'll figure this out together. So just straight up acknowledging and validating 
that they're upset, angry, frustrated, fearful, whatever it is, and that you're, you're with them with that. Yeah, I agree. I, I like that. I like that advice a lot. I would, I would add um, to maybe ask them some questions about it. it, you know, depending on how verbal they are and, and how, how much of a conversation you can have. I think to your point, Jean, sometimes we're afraid to acknowledge what's really going on. Um, people will say, oh, I feel like I'm losing my mind. My memory is so bad. And what we want to do is to comfort them and say, it's not that bad, right? You're, you're doing fine. Um, that's not really helpful. If they have an awareness, things are, I am losing my memory. I know what's going on with me. Uh, what they need to hear is, um, this is tough. I'm so sorry that you're going through yeah. this. Maybe ask them some questions to see where their pain points are. And then you can kind of target, um, target your responses a little bit, because if they know that things are changing with them and they don't like people helping them, right? Then, then because they feel like, uh, you know, other people getting in my space and, and doing things for me is, is just causing more confusion. It's making it harder for me. Um, then you can kind of tailor the way you provide help. But if the person says, I, I feel like I'm losing my, I need you to do everything for me now. I can't remember to do anything, right? Then, you know, they're, they're a little more open to your help. Right. So you can, you can approach Absolutely. them differently. And I think what you've just described is, you know, to, to ask some of those questions. And then what we talked about earlier applies is um, listen and observe mm -hmm. <laughs> because you're going to get more, hopefully more information in that answer about how you should then proceed or respond. Yes. Not just listening, right? Because they may not be answering you directly with words, right? It might, it might be more behavioral um, of a response. So not just listening, also observing, as you said. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of great uh, comments in the chat as well responding to that. Um, so definitely, um, I think we're all on kind of the same page there. And Real quickly, it, there's a couple questions um, and then we kind of talked about it in the presentation, but how do you respond to anger? What do you say and do? I know we kind of covered that and um, you know, there was another question that just came through. What happens when the anger is so bad with them? Are there facilities that are better um, for them than just like a, your standard assisted living um, right. facility? Yeah, com yeah, agitation is not always just passive, right? Sometimes it's 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 aggressive anger um, and yelling. And actually, I would say the the same answer kind of applies uh, to the first question: How do you respond to anger? Um, don't ignore it. Don't don't try to dismiss it or or convince the person that they shouldn't be angry, right? Who among us? I, I've been in these kind of fights before, where I'm upset about something, and the person I'm fighting with says you just need to calm down, right? Uh, you, should, you don't need to be so upset, right? Has that, that, that ever think, worked on me? <laughs> yeah, that, I think that no. triggers the amygdala. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I have a right to my emotions. I have a right to my anger. So does the person with dementia. Whether you can understand why they're angry or not is a whole separate question. And in that moment is not really relevant, right? So let them feel the anger and say, I can see you're really ticked off right now right? Allow them the ability, allow them the, the gift of their anger, right? I mean, you don't want to, you don't want them to be unsafe, of course, but um, just saying, I can see this is such a struggle for you, or even if you don't know why they're so mad, right? I did something wrong. So just saying, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm not doing a good job here. I'm going to kind of back away for a little bit. You know, apologizing, even when you don't know what you're apologizing for, um, super helpful. Um, the, the, the question about um, uh, responding, uh, are, there, are there facilities that are sort of more than just assisted living? And absolutely, um, I'll, I'll refer you on to another education program that we have called Care Options um, on the topic of uh, residential placement options. We have two different, two different care options classes. One's about at-home resources and one's about residential placement. Um, and in that program, we talk about um, assisted living versus memory care or dementia care communities, which are assisted living communities that specialize in supporting people who are living with dementia. Um, so in answer to that question, yes, uh, there, there are places where this, there's more staff 
the staff is more is better trained in responding to people with dementia and, and can kind of handle more of the, the challenging behaviors. Anything uh, you would you would add there? Nope, I think you covered it all. Okay. All right, so I think that I am up next. So let me I have the remote control. It says yes, but come on. Oh, okay. There we go. Resources for additional support. So, um, you know, as has been the theme through today's presentation about being in the water and the waves, again, going back to what Amy said, don't swim alone, folks. Honestly, don't. Uh, that's what we're here for Alzheimer's San Diego, and there's all sorts of other resources out there as well, too. So educate yourself um, in terms of things like this webinar, managing resistance, in, in other webinars like communication skills, in other resources and supports to improve your skill level, your knowledge level, and to help reduce anxiety. If we feel like we have more tools at hand, uh, to manage different situations, it does help us to feel like we've got a, you know, a, a, a better grip on things, a better handle on things. Identify community resources and um, know that you can come to Alzheimer's San Diego for that. Well, that's a lot of the work that we do behind the scenes with clinical services is to compile lists of resources for um, people. So know that you don't necessarily have to go out and do that on your own. Give us, give us a call. Get a break of some kind. Um, uh, and by break, we mean some time away from your role as a care partner and your responsibilities as a care partner. Everybody needs a little bit of time away. And look at the supports that are around you and make sure you have a good well um, developed support system that gives you kind of all the different things that you need as you continue your role as a care partner. And so Alzheimer's San Diego, here's um, a visual of kind of all the different things that we do. Uh, one of the most important things for everybody to know if you did not already is that all of our programs and services are at no cost to uh, the community of San Diego. And so a variety of different supports and resources you can use. Talk to a dementia expert, you can call us or uh, send in an email or live chat us and a member of our clinical services team of which Preston is a member and I am as well too, in addition to other colleagues we will assist you. And when you, if you have filled out any of those follow-up forms today, it will be one of the members of this team that will uh, be contacting you to follow up with your specific questions. We continue to have virtual support groups um, and we've got uh, kind of the, the guidelines and instructions for um, joining those support groups on our website at www.alzsd.org. Uh, our online education and training, clearly you're here with us today and that will continue on. And you do also then have the webinar library at your fingertips. Our volunteer tech team is available to assist families, not here, not only just here with our um, Zoom webinars that we do for education, but if you're having problems with uh, Zoom or, or FaceTime or some other, uh, platform that you use, say, to communicate with family and, and to attend other classes, um, you can always reach out to us for a volunteer tech team to member to assist you with some of the tech issues that we all have. We have social activities and outings for people living with a diagnosis of dementia and their care partners. Again, the information is on our website. We do support local research here in San Diego County, folks and are um, pleased to be you know, working with and, and supporting that research and all these folks here uh, in the science community that are working towards um, a cure and, and medications and better and deeper knowledge and so forth regarding dementias. We have a respite program uh, for called ALS uh, Companions, 
And this is uh, matching up a volunteer companion to families with a diagnosis of dementia. This is virtually at this point in time. We have VITALS. This is again a volunteer-based program where we have trained volunteers staying in touch by phone with people who are living alone in the community with a diagnosis of some type of dementia. So that's just a quick overview of some of the different things that we do as an organization. Again, you can visit our website for further information and resources. Uh, Amy mentioned the tip sheets that we have and you can access those on our website as well with the specifics of uh, caregiving scenarios, the, the examples that she was talking about bathing and uh, medications and such. And of course, that's where our video and webinar library is. Uh, call us, email us, or live chat us, any of those things you can do. And also, of course, that follow-up form. We'll get Preston to uh, pop that out in chat again, if you would, one last time. Thank you, Preston. What we have upcoming, folks, uh, next week is um, Safety at Home. And that's on Thursday, December 9th at 1 p.m. So we'll be talking about all the ins and outs of looking at um, general safety in, in the home and some of the steps care partners can take to um, ensure a, a safer environment for the person living with dementia. On Wednesday, December 15th, we have a caregiver panel, Confessions of a Caregiver, Men's Perspectives. We'll have a panel of gentlemen talking about their experiences as caregivers from the male point of view. We have a drop in education hour on Tuesday, December 21st at 12 p.m. No agenda that day, no uh, topics are planned. It is uh, a drop in, so come with any questions, concerns, things that you wanna talk about and it will be open doors and come on in and, and let's talk about things. Details and pre-registration for all of these events are available on our website. And as always, we appreciate your feedback. And so as we're wrapping up here, you will receive a link to an online survey and we ask you to complete that for us, please. It's always very important uh, information that we review and take to heart to be sure. A uh, copy of program materials will be emailed to all of you today. Anybody who has registered and uh, will be receiving a copy of those slides that we were uh, looking at here today. And of course, again, referencing our webinar library that recordings of education programs are available for you there to have a look at. Please, please feel free to do that. You can do that at your convenience. So. We thank you all for being with us here today. Thank you, Jacob, for being our tech team support and to Preston for being our um, clinical services, social work support today. Uh, we had you guys working a little past closing time here today, so thank you. And of course, to Amy, as always, for being our, our frontline leader on all these important topics. and. Take care, everyone. Have a good evening. Any final thoughts from any of the rest of you folks? And from me, uh, really been a pleasure. Thank you for your questions and, and your, your sharing with us. We're glad you were here. We hope it was helpful and we hope to see you again soon. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.